All right, so you are back, and I'm back, and I'm grateful that um, we're back on this platform. So thank you again for joining me. Thank you for agreeing to um, want to understand what resilience is and how um, you gain leadership by the kind of resilience that you provide, okay, to the people around you and to your environment. So today, like I mentioned earlier on, I'm going to take a look at the life of four people or five, rather five persons who have been hit by one form of um, sickness or the other, but have resolved that in spite of the sickness, regardless of the challenges arising from the sickness, they are going to live a better life. They are going to do things better than the world had ever expected of them um, to do. So we're going to be looking at these persons. We're going, going to be um, taking a cue from their lives and we're going to observe what they mean by how they have lived. Now, some of the persons you're going to be watching and learning from today will beat your imagination, all right? They will challenge your life. They will challenge your resolve as a human being as a leader or as a leader that you are. And like I said, um, the, the world had basically written them off, but they refused to give up. They refused to be uh, taken aback by their form of, of challenge. So we're going to take a look at these four or five persons, and I'm hoping that you draw a lesson from their life and what they, they stand for. Now, there's no time, so we'll just go straight into um, today's lesson. And I'm hoping that, um, um, I'm hoping that you would learn from um, each and every one of them. So let me begin with Sam Byrne. Now, what you see on your screen will get you into some form of uh, of shock well not really a shock but some form of a surprise this is sam burn he died in 2014 as a 17 year old boy so the picture that you see on your screen does not correlate with his age that's because just before he was two years old he was diagnosed with uh Prejoria. Prejoria is a disease that um, attacks young people and makes them grow old, makes them grow older than their ages. So you see Sam um, at the age of 17, looking at a 65, looking like a 65 or 70 year old person. All right. That's because he was diagnosed with the disease of Prejoria and Prejoria simply makes your heart grow older makes your limbs your skin and everything about you grow older than they should have been growing um, older so the average expectation for sam and his peers again this is such a rare disease okay it's such a rare disease and there are only about 350 people the world over that have this, this disease, about 350 people the world over that are known, recorded to have this disease. And their average expected age term, all right, is 13 years. Most of them die at the age of 13. So at 13, they would have grown probably nine, 10 times faster than they should have grown. So at the age of 13, they begin to look like people of 80-something years old, just like Sam. Sam Byrne looks at the moment. He lived a happy and a fulfilled life. That's the interesting thing about Sam Byrne. He did unthinkable things, things that could not be um, um, perceived to have taken place from such a young person. Okay? So this... Um, in spite of his challenge, in spite of his health challenge, Sam lived a healthy life, so to speak. He lived a pleasant life. 
And I think at this stage, it would just be better if we heard from Sam and then continue from there. I want you to get to know me. This is my life. things that Sam had in life and um, expected people to have for him in life was the fact that he didn't want anyone to pity him. Okay? He didn't want a situation where people will look down on him, at him, and feel um, this is a pitiable object or this is uh, someone that should be looked down on. No. Sam was such a strong boy was such a healthy, I keep using the word healthy, even though I know that what killed him was a health condition. But he was such a pleasant person. For those from the tweets that we saw on the screen, for those who knew Sam, they knew him to be a happy fellow, a jolly fellow. You know, at the age of 17, so by the way, he had to live three years older than what was expected of him uh, to have lived, okay? But he did that because he was resilient. He was tough. He was difficult to break. He didn't believe that because he was um, um, 17 or because he was young that anyone should look down at him and give him favors where oh, yeah, he didn't know. deserve favors, okay? That was Sam for you. And, um, okay, so just a story from his life, haven't read or studied from his life, is the fact that um, he realized, okay, he realized one time when he wanted to play in the school band that being uh, 50 pounds in terms of weight, the school drum that he wanted to play was 40 pounds. So he was just 10 pounds bigger than or heavier than the, the school drum. But... He persisted and insisted he wanted to play that drum until uh, people took up the challenge to remodel the drum to bring it down to about uh, 20, 20 uh, pounds. So he was able to carry it. I think it was about 10 pounds. He was able to carry it and match with the school band. So for some, no was not going to be an answer. All right? No was not going to be an answer. He was tough. He was resilient. He pushed on as hard as he felt he should, to the extent that he lived to become 17 years old, as against uh, what people's expectation was, that he would live to be 13 years and then pass on. Now, what are the things that we can glean from uh, his life as lessons to us today? First, all right, his conclusion was that uh, you didn't need to 
his condition couldn't define him. That was his first thought, that his condition couldn't define him. He was weak. He was sick. He was feeble. Yet, he attempted things that only stronger people could do, at least in our thoughts and expectations, that only stronger people could do. Now, he never threw a pity party. In a documentary called This is Life, Sam bargained to be on that documentary only because they were assured, or he was assured by the persons doing the documentary that they were not going to put him out. They were only going to do the documentary so people could learn from him. He was a strong chap. He was resilient in all that he did. And so this is the expectation for every one of us out there. For you to be an outstanding leader, for you to be known, for you to leave a legacy behind, you have got to be tough. You have got to disallow your conditions to define you. So, you see, some of us allow our conditions to define us. So what do I mean? You were born in a poor background. And because of that, you've thrown a pity party concerning your life. You've told yourself that it is difficult and impossible to surpass certain levels of life. Therefore, you have allowed your conditions to define you. Some of us had drunkards as parents, but chose not to drink. All right? Some had thieves as parents, but were determined never to steal. Those are strong leaders. For those of us who are Nigerians, we remember, again, just using him as an example, but I think virtually all of our presidents and head of states have been like that, that they were from no background. Nobody knew them. So it was with Obasanjo, so it was with Good Love Jonathan, from the water side, like we said, from the background. But they rose up and have become household names today on the lips of people. There is hardly anyone who threw a pity party based on his or her background that grew beyond expectation. Sam Burns was resilient. He didn't allow his condition define him or determine who he was. He grew beyond his condition. He was bigger and tougher than his condition. And he says this, no matter what I choose to become, I believe that I can change the world. And as I am striving to change the world, I will be happy. Now you can imagine such a feeble structure dreaming to change the world. How much more you, who is strong, who is healthy, who is nearly perfect in all your ways, all your makeups, giving up on life. You cannot afford to give up on life. Yes, I hear you when you say Nigeria's economy is tough. I agree. It is exceptionally tough, but not for only you. Remember, the richest black man is a Nigerian in the same economy. Well, go ahead, make your excuses. Tell me of how he's been patronized by government. But I'll tell you that while he was at the background before he became patronized, he strove hard. He fought hard to be recognized. And today, he is known and well recognized. Behave like Sam Burns. Fight against your conditions and not long from now, you will discover that you are making a headway. Now, the second person 
I would like to talk about. Incidentally, this man is still alive. His name is Paul Alexander. Paul Alexander is 72 or 73 years old today, or right now. All right? He was attacked by polio when he was six years old. And you know, when polio attacked, because then there were no polio vaccines, when polio attacked him, all of his limbs went dead. From his neck down, Paul Alexander is paralyzed. But today, based on his resilience, he is a lawyer. He is an author. He has written his own autobiography by himself. And you wonder how, because his hands are paralyzed, his legs are paralyzed. But I tell you, he didn't dictate to anyone to write. He wrote it himself by typing. So he uses his mouth to type. He does all that he needs to do, all that he requires to do with his mouth. Guess what? There are so many clients. At one point, he said he had over 40 clients who insisted they would not see or meet any lawyer apart from him. Why? Because they were of the belief that if he could beat polio from age six, if he could beat his breathlessness, because again, at one point during the ailment at age six, he couldn't breathe for himself. And you would see the canister in which he's living in the, within. He leaves that canister for only a few hours every day. Now, that is called the iron lungs. It helps him to breathe. Without it, he can barely survive for six hours. Now, he's become a lawyer, like I said. He represents people, and the resolve or the reason for his clients going over to him is the fact that if he could beat that disease, he could if he could overcome that disease, then he must be tough and resilient and be able to beat any other challenge that will come his way. And so people run to Paul to represent them in courts. People run to Paul to represent them in courts. There are so many others who have refused to make well of their lives. There are so many healthy people who wake up from morning after morning grumbling. They forget the things that they have and focus on the things that they do not have. Now, Paul says he's able to survived because he's got loved ones around him. His mother fought hard for him to stay alive. So also his father. He's got a caretaker who comes daily to take care of him. While she was living far, she's now lived close to him. She now lives beneath him, on the flat beneath him, just to be able to take care of Paul. What a resolve. Now he says this, they just loved me. They said you can do anything, and I believed it. This is Paul speaking. They said you can do anything, and I believed it. Just so it wouldn't sound like, uh, so it wouldn't sound like uh, I'm making fables. Let's hear Paul speak, even as we follow this, uh, this broadcast, all right? Let's hear him speak, even as we follow this broadcast. And I'm hoping that this challenges every one of us to be resilient in whatsoever we do. It's a very strange world for me, just normal. 
wherever I go, he goes. It's like a, you know, your best friend, the ghost that comes to play me. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, such an inspiring story from Paul. Now, what are some of the things that we draw from this man's life? What are some of the things that we could learn from Paul's resolve to be an overcomer? All right? The first is that you must believe in yourself. To be resilient, you must believe in yourself. Believe in your abilities. Believe in your capability to do the unthinkable. Never give up on life. You see, every one of us at birth came with bundles and bundles of resources. We came with abilities to do things that nothing could stop us from not death not life not height not color not race not creed we all have this talent all right that no one else in the world could reproduce and to be a resilient person you must dig deep down to get at those talents, to get at those abilities, to force them out of yourself. And excuse me, you cannot wait for anyone to pull them out of you. 
Of course, if there be anyone to pull them out of you, it's got to be your challenges. Tough times. <laughs> Excuse me. All right? Tough times never last. Only tough people do. Never give up on life. You do not have money now? Do not give up on life. That's not the end of the story. That's probably just a chapter in the story, but it's not an end in the story. You heard Alexander talk about being hungry for education. And because he was hungry for education, he kept pushing his parents. He kept pushing, pushing, pushing until his parents took him to school. Until his parents took him to school, he didn't give up. And you know what? We cannot afford to give up. You must be hungry for victory. You must be hungry for success. And the hungrier you are, the more satisfied you would likely be. Keep pushing. Thank you, uh, Mother Kibarnabas, for your comments. And for those of us who do not understand Hausa language, he's saying this truly is speaking from experience. Thank you so much. And I know that a, no, a number of us have experienced hardship in life. A number of us have experienced tough times in life, but have refused to give up. We have continued to press on, to push on. A number of people have broken grounds, have started new things that were hitherto thought to be impossible. For some people, the word impossible does not exist except in the dictionary. Now, that's the life of Alexander Paul and the things that we can draw from him. And to be resilient, you must keep learning. Again, for Paul, he realized you need education, you need a degree to be able to achieve and attain the things that you want to achieve and attain in life. Any form of learning is or should be good enough. Any form of learning should be good enough. And I challenge you to keep learning. To keep learning because the more you learn the better you become the more you learn the better you become the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is usually in the things that they learn and i'm not talking about formal education i'm just talking about the ability to learn with the internet today you can sit anywhere and learn anything that you want to learn. But my challenge this hour is keep learning, keep pushing. And like Paul, never take a no for an answer. When he told his parents he wanted to school, he wanted to school, his parents told him no, it wasn't for him, but he kept pressing on. And because he kept pressing on, it got to a time that he caved in, sent him to school. Today he's a lawyer, he's 72 years old, he's still representing people in courts. The machine in which he lives in is growing older and older, weaker and weaker. Um, and right now, I think in the whole of US, there are only about two or three other people living in this same condition by, the, by living with the iron lungs. Because it was no longer necessary um, 
they stop mass production of the iron lungs. But Paul has continued to enjoy this and has continued to press on in life for as long as he will live. So he says. Now, who else should we be looking at? Polio seems to have done great damage. Very great damage. By the way, my immediate younger brother was attacked by polio. So one of his limbs is uh, his um, left foot. All right? Rather, his right foot. Sorry, his right foot has been um, has shrunken. All right? So he limps when he walks. Now, I remember in the early 70s, when polio ravaged Nigeria, there were a number of people around him who some lost their lives, some went blind, some lost both limbs, some lost all four limbs, but he was fortunate to have had one limb, only one limb affected. And up till today, we even crack jokes with him over um, the limb. But you know what? He's a good basketballer. He's retired now. But he's played basketball efficiently and effectively. He's married, takes care of dogs. In fact, right now, in addition to helping in coaching basketball, also joins in, um, uh, also trains rare dogs for sale. Manasseh is his name. So, Polio had attacked Paul Alexander. Polio has attacked Apollo and Eliana, two Brazilians who have lived in the hospital for over 30 years. Virtually all of their um, age mates who were attacked by polio are dead. In fact, at one point, they were abandoned by family in the hospital. That's why they've continued to live in the hospital. However, they are still standing tall. They are still enjoying life. They are friends to each other. Why? Because of the resolve in their hearts to live. Because of the strength within them to never give up regardless of what life presents. So, these two persons, interesting persons, very strong and are still uh, living on. Perhaps what we should do at this stage is to listen to Paul and Eliana as they speak, all right, regarding their conditions. And probably, like we always say, hear from the um, horse's mouth as it is. And then we'll say a few things after. Paolo and Hiki Machado share some of his most cherished memories. Images of a life spent here in this room mostly confined to his bed for 43 years. Paulo and Hiki is paralyzed from the waist down. He breathes with the help of a respirator. As an infant, he contracted polio and was sent to live in the hospital. Some of those years in the dreaded iron lung like these. It was the 1970s before vaccines eradicated polio in Brazil. That's Pedro. Back then, it was him and me. We were very close. He was my best friend. Children with serious infections were sent to the Clinicas Hospital in Sao Paulo with little hope of survival. There were nine of them here with Paulo and Hiki. His mother had died two days after he was born. The rest of his family soon stopped coming to see him. The polio ward was his home, the staff and fellow patients, his family. It was a wonderful time. I'll never forget it. Even though most of our friends are no longer with us, I never stopped dreaming about them. Over the years, many died, including his best friend, Pedro. It was December 26, the day after Christmas. Everything I'd planned with my friend, life, it didn't have the same meaning. But it made me stronger. Two people survived, Paolo and Hiki and his lifelong friend and roommate, Eliana Zaghi. We are like brother and sister, and we look after each other. 
Eliana suffered paralysis caused by polio when she was a baby. She's lived in the hospital for 38 years. Hello, I've been here since I was one year and nine months old. I learned to write, to paint, to use a cell phone, a computer, things I like. They were both encouraged to push beyond their physical limitations. Eliana discovered painting, patiently dabbing at the canvas with a brush taped to a tongue depressor. The wear and tear on her teeth meant she had to limit herself, but she hasn't stopped. Paulo and Hinky trained as a computer animator and is now working on a cartoon about his life with the help of crowdfunding. Dr. Nuno da Silva has worked in the ICU since 1988. He says Paulo and Hinky and Eliana are inspirations. We've had young patients that we've taken to their room. They're examples to show that it isn't the end of the world. Paulo and Hiki's biggest passions are movies and video games, opportunities to escape his own world. I like to live outside my reality. To get out of reality, I play games. In the games, I can go where I want without suffering pain. He tells us that soon video games are going to take him out into the real world, a rare trip outside the hospital walls to visit a video game convention. A trip we don't want to miss. Shasta Darlington, CNN, Sao Paulo. This should be exceptionally, exceptionally inspiring. These guys have lived in the hospital for years. They have, they have for the, the, so for Enrique, he's, he's lived 43 years. For Elena, about 34 years. In the hospital, abandoned by family and friends. But when you hear what they have achieved, because of their resolve to press on, you will be so amazed. You will be so amazed. They have refused to give up on life. Eliana paints with her mouth, even though all other limbs are, 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 are handicapped. All right? Polo works with the computer. He's now into animation, talking about his life story using animation. He plays games. These are things that healthy people can hardly do. These are things that healthy people can hardly do. We must learn to be resilient in spite of all that comes against us. We must learn to show how tough we are and how tough we can be regardless of what comes against us. In fact, your leadership is more pronounced when you show how tough and how resilient you are. So Asake, love, uh, Bitru sends this comment, and I think it's, 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 it's worthy to look at it. It says, so many people have said, if you are above 50 or 50, that you can never be rich again. I wondered how can someone think like that? It was a challenge said to someone. Why, sir? Well, let me tell you a contrary view that I've heard. Someone once said that if you are rich uh, before being 40, all right? that you can never be saved. Both statements are falsehood. Asaki, let me tell you, you know of KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was developed by uh, Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders was 69 years old or thereabouts. 
when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. In fact, he was of that school of thought also that when you were beyond 50, you couldn't be rich. Then he got to that stage, thought of committing suicide, but told himself, hold on, I can fry chicken. Let me fry it once or twice and sell it out. If I don't make money, then I know that all is over for me. But if I make money, then my life starts. Let me tell you, in the late 60s, when this man retired, he sold out the organization for millions of dollars. He died a rich person. So it is falsehood for anyone to think that when you are 50 you can, or beyond, you cannot be rich. It is falsehood. And there are so many people who have proved these things. There are so many people who have proved that statement wrong, that when you are 50 and beyond, you can't be rich. So many people have proved them wrong. Because when you look around you, you see people who are 60 and 70 becoming rich, even at the tail end of their lives. A resilient leader will keep pushing on until he or she arrives at their goal. So from Paulo and Eliana, we learn this. Number one, to be resilient, you need to make good friends. Friends who will and encourage you to keep moving on. Friends who do not discourage you or look back. Friends who are tough, resilient. Again, to be resilient, you've got to enjoy life. Enjoy what you love doing. It's Cristiano Ronaldo who says he will play football until he's 40. He loves playing football. And usually at the age of 30, March 35, people get tired and start wearing out. But he's resolved to enjoy life because he enjoys playing football. He goes to gym to train and train until he becomes younger at, 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 at energy. He's renewed always. So for you to show resilience, you've got to keep enjoying life. You've got to keep enjoying life. Enjoy the things that you love doing. Do the things that you love doing. Don't let anybody... You see, in this part of the world, particularly in Africa, we have a mindset that tells us that careers are limited to only certain things. You are either a lawyer, a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, or an engineer. And anything outside of that, we consider them to be less interesting. We consider them to also be... Um, we consider them to also be uh, meaningless. But you know what? For everyone who wants to show resilience, you've got to keep pushing on. You've got to enjoy life. You've got to do the things that you love doing. Again, you must dream big. Because you see, when you have a big picture ahead of you, nothing distracts you. When you have a big picture ahead of you, nothing discourages you. You just keep pushing on until life itself gives of you what you demand of it. This is quite an interesting thing. Okay? Let's move on 
I've got one more person to speak about, and his name is Dr. Sean Stevenson. Dr. Sean Stevenson was born in uh, May 5, 1979, and he died in 2019, I think, yeah, at the age of 44 or thereabout. He's an American therapist, a self-help author, a motivational speaker. He was born with osteogenesis imperfecta. What this simply means is that his bones were weak and feeble. It meant that even at an error to twist his ankle or twist his elbow, the bones would get broken. Imagine that kind of life that you stumbled on something and fell down meant you will not get up the way that you fell. Something in you must break. That's Dr. Sean for you. Because of that condition and how many times his bones had broken, he stood only three feet tall and could only stand on a wheelchair. So he constantly sat on a wheelchair so that he doesn't get accidented and then breaks more of his bones. But if you see him in, in, in life, you see some form of, um, of, of irregular shape as far as his bones are concerned. But this man, in spite of his condition, studied, became a doctor, had a wife and children, lived a good life, encouraged hundreds of thousands of people, motivated so many people just using his life story. How else can we define the word resilient? How else can we talk about resilience than to talk about people like this man who always indicated all right, who always showed us that you could forge ahead in spite of all that troubled you. Now, what we should do is get him to speak for himself. Perhaps that will encourage us to fight for all the things that we've been waiting on as far as life is concerned. Okay, so that those of us who easily give up on life will know not to give up. Lesson number one. Okay. Never believe a prediction that doesn't empower you. Hmm. When I was born, the doctors told my parents that I would be dead within the first 24 hours of my life. 35 years later, all those doctors are dead. And I am the only doctor that remains. Never believe a prediction that doesn't empower you. How many predictions have been thrown at you your whole life? If you believe predictions that do not empower you, you will wither away and die. Either physically die or your spirit will die as you just walk around the world like a carcass that is just following the masses. You will be given a lot of titles in your life. You will be told so many different things. You must only listen to that which empowers you. I have a belief that has served me in my life, and that is that everyone is rooting for me to win, even those that do not know it. And I am not here today to tell you that I have had adversity in my life, and so therefore I know what you're going through. I don't have a clue what any of you are going through in your life. 
I did not grow up in your neighborhood, more than likely. I did not have your set of parents, nor do I live in your body. I have not had the events that you've had happen to you. I can tell you I am only an expert on one thing, and that's how to be me. And I do it well. But it's not come easily. I've gone through things that I don't wish upon anyone in this room. I've had metal rods pulled out of bone marrow while I was awake. I've had jaw infections where teeth were actually extracted and I can no longer chew my own food. I have to get up every day and be showered and cared for physically by another human being. Fortunately, she's a gorgeous woman that I married. I get stared at everywhere I go, and the moment people meet me, if they don't know a thing about my resume, they automatically, just by the human nature, think to themselves, oh, it must be so difficult to be that man. If somebody pities me, they're wasting their time. Because I have chosen a life of strength. And I am here to help you choose a life of strength. But I'm going to tell you, we talked about drugs here. You know what the worst drug to ever hit the human race is? Pity. All right. I think we can safely learn at this point. And when I say safely, I mean we can safely learn at this point. Two or three things we'll learn from Sean Stevenson. One, don't believe a prediction that doesn't empower you. So when people talk to you about family curse, people talk to you about faulty family background. People talk about talk to you about um, your lack of education in certain fields. People talk to you about your economic strength. People make predictions regarding whether your nation will blow up into pieces or not. Please, I beg of you, like Sean advised, don't believe predictions that won't empower you. Don't believe predictions that tend to weigh you down. That tend to tell you that the world is coming to an end. Therefore, do not rise up to do things for yourself. Don't believe predictions that tell you that because nobody has ever done it in your family, then it is impossible for you to do it. Those are falsehoods. Those are unnecessary predictions. Those are unhealthy predictions, and you must cut away from them and the people that make such predictions. Secondly, choose a life of strength. Choose a life of strength. A life that tells you that nothing is impossible. Therefore, go at it. Choose that kind of life. And of course, thirdly, never throw a pity party. Every one of us has a reason to be pitied. But not every one of us sits down to be pitied. There are so many of us who are getting up, rising up, and doing things. Things that they should have been sitting down to be pitied. But they determine they will not be pitied. Therefore, they do not have time for anyone to pity them. Now, my friends. This is my package for this hour as far as resilience is concerned. 
I encourage you to go out there to achieve the things that you had thought you could achieve, but time had changed your mind or mentality over them. I encourage you to remain resilient, to remain tough, to look at the conditions of Polo and Eliana, of Dr. Sean, of Paul, the lawyer, of Sam. Look at their conditions. Make a comparison with your own condition and see if you are not at an advantage as far as they are concerned. But you know what? The, for Sam and Sean who are dead, they've left their prints on the sands of time. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for resolving to be resilient. Have a blessed week ahead of you. Bye-bye.